If you have your Bibles, turn them to Revelation chapter 12 this morning. Revelation chapter 12. We are, uh, have been going through the book of Revelation and uh, we've been trying to uh, determine what the meaning of this book is. It is a hotly debated book. It's one that uh, a lot of people claim to understand, a lot of people don't claim to understand. Um, I'm one of those that I have struggled with this book for a long, long time, for many years um, it, it's one that I have avoided teaching uh, and preaching because uh, it's such a difficult book. Uh, but I felt that uh, I needed to uh, be brave <laughs> and do my best to, to teach from uh, God's Word, to teach the whole counsel of God. Uh, and I'm pretty confident that no matter what the details of Revelation mean, the overall meaning of the book is that God wins certain victory. God wins. He is going to be victorious, and we want to be on His side when everything ends. Okay? That is basically the 30,000-foot view of the book of Revelation. But, as you know, we can't just stay at 30,000 feet. We've got to land. We've got to land the plane. We've got to uh, go among the people. We've got to, we can't stay up there forever, and so we need to look at the details. So I just want to give you a little recap of uh, this book so far. Revelation is a series of signs and symbols and visions given to the Apostle John near the end of the first century. It was meant to encourage the church during an intense time of persecution and tribulation. Primarily, this book was written to people who lived in the first century. Okay? It certainly has meaning for us today. It certainly is Im- important for us today. Uh, but for us to treat the book of Revelation or any other book of the Bible for that matter as something that just sort of fell out of the sky and hit us in the head in 2022 and, and that God is writing directly to us and that it has no bearing on its original audience, that is, that is uh, not good Bible interpretation. And so we need to understand first what it meant for them before we can decide what it means for us. John is instructed to write personal letters to seven churches in Asia Minor, encouraging them to faithfulness and repentance during these times. Revelation chapters 2 through 3. John also writes down a series of visions he has, uh, which begin with a vision of the throne room of God. In the throne room, the one who sits on the throne awaits someone who is worthy to take a scroll with seven seals on it from his hand and open it. We found a few weeks ago that the scroll represents what will happen in human history. And so this idea of the seven seals on the scroll being opened and someone being worthy to open those, uh, those seals and open that scroll and determine what's going to happen in human history, that is the discussion of a section of this book. Uh, that, that is the, the point of that is to say, who is worthy to, overcome, to, to oversee the affairs of man? Who's going to take care of us? Who's going to take care of our problems, our issues? Who's going to save us? That is the the question of this sealed scroll. That's chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation. We find uh, very shortly after that the slain lamb is worthy to take uh, it and begins opening the seals. And what the open seals reveal is God's judgment against the evildoers, especially Rome, who is persecuting the church. They also reveal that those who have been redeemed by the lamb will be able to stand God's judgment. They will be able to stand in God's judgment, both temporal and eternal. Both the judgment that God would bring down during that time and also in the final judgment. That's Revelation chapter 6 and 7. The final seal that's open reveals another set of seven. There were seven seals. The final seal reveals seven angels blowing trumpets, which announce something else. These trumpets, again, describe God's judgment against the nations. They describe largely the same thing that the seven seals did, but with an added bonus. They reveal that it is not God's harsh judgment 
which would turn evildoers toward God, but rather the faithful, self-sacrificing, enemy-loving witness of God's people about the slain, slain lamb. It wasn't going to be the, the harsh judgment that God brought down upon the nations uh, for their evil doing that was going to convert people. Rather, it was the merciful, self-sacrificial love of God's people. What's that, that uh, verse that we quote sometimes and that song that we sing? They will know we are Christians by what? By our love. Not by our judgment, not by our anger, not by our disagreement, but by our love. This seems to be the message of the trumpets, that it is our faithful witness of following in the footsteps of the slain lamb, of showing our love even for our enemies that is going to turn people to God. This ends with heaven being opened up and the Ark of the Covenant representing God's presence being revealed. And this would make a fine ending for the book. The, end, the, the book could end at Revelation chapter 11. These trumpets get blown. Uh, the, the, the scroll is finally, finally revealed that it is the, the faithful witness of God's people that is going to save the world, that is going to, to bring the world to Christ. Uh, it could have ended there. The, the, the temple opens up and, and we're able to, to see uh, God's presence in the form of the Ark of the Covenant. We're able to, to see God's presence that would, could be a fitting end to the book of Revelation. It could have ended right there. But instead of ending at chapter 11, John is then shown a series of signs that go all the way back to the beginning and explain on a large scale and then on a smaller scale what is happening. So chapters 12 through 14 are giving us the big picture and encouraging the readers to endure because of the judgment and temptation that is ahead. Okay? This is an encouragement for endurance. In fact, John says that twice in this section of Scripture. This is an encouragement to endure, for you to endure what's going to happen. So, without further ado, let's go to Revelation chapter 12. And let's notice uh, this wonderful section of Scripture, which is a pause in the action between... So, you have the seven seals, and then you have the seven trumpets... And then later we'll have the seven bowls, which largely talk about the same thing as the seven seals and the seven trumpets, okay? This is a pause in between that to zoom out and look at the big picture. Revelation chapter 12, starting with verse 1. We're going to notice in the beginning here in chapter 12 something that you might find familiar. It is the cosmic struggle. Okay? It is the struggle of God versus his enemy on a cosmic level. Uh, and, and when we read it, it's going to remind you of the birth story of Christ. Okay? It's going to remind you of the birth story of Christ, and that's because it's supposed to remind you of the birth story of Christ. You know that song that we sing, Silent Night? You know? Oh, yeah, it's so cute. There's a little baby, silent night. You know, all right. You know, it's like, it's a cute little song and everything is silent. That is probably the most false song in our songbook. Well, I don't know. I don't know. There are some other songs that are pretty false. But that one is false. It was not a silent night. It may have been silent in the very village that Jesus was being born in, but on a grand scale, on a cosmic scale, it was not a silent night. Let's look at verse 1. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. 
And she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has, uh, has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Now, this is highly symbolic. It is not literally referring to the birth of Christ from Mary. The woman is not meant to be representative of Mary. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. But it brings our minds back to that moment of Jesus is about to be born. You know, we sing that song, Silent Night. Oh, everything's cute. It was not silent. The enemy, Satan, the beast, the dragon, the great red dragon as we'll find out that he's Satan in just a minute. He did not want Jesus to be born. He did not want the Messiah to be born. He did not want God to accomplish his purposes. It was not silent. In fact, we'll read in just a minute about a great battle that's happening because the Messiah is being born. This woman, the woman with the... Twelve, the crown of 12 stars and uh, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Many people have interpreted this to, be actual, to actually be Mary, uh, but that really doesn't fit all of the details um, of, of who this woman is. Most likely, this woman is, is representative of the community of faith. The Jews and the Christians that brought about the community of faith, that brought about the need for a Messiah, someone who uh, is a chosen one who would save people. Okay. So the red dragon, we know uh, from verse 9, as, as we continue down, we'll find out from verse 9 that he is named, the red dragon is Satan, the accuser. Now, interestingly, Satan, we know him, you know, you think about Satan, what do you think about? You know, like, you know, he's got little horns and a forked tail and a pitchfork. That's Hollywood Satan, okay? I mean, I, I, I don't know any other way to put it. Just like Hollywood angels are little creepy naked babies, okay? That is, that is the... Um, <laughs> that's the Hollywood version. That is the, uh, the Hobby Lobby version of angels, okay? The reality is that they are much scarier, okay? Terrifying, actually, uh, when you read their descriptions in the Bible, okay? The reality of Satan, he's not, you know, just like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get you with my little pitchfork, okay? That, that's not the reality of Satan. In fact, Revelation describes him as this great red evil dragon. He is so big and so powerful that with his tail, he could sweep the stars of heaven down out of the sky. Okay, obviously that's hyperbole and symbolic language, but it's meant to describe to us that Satan is a a very formidable created being. His original job, as the text tells us, was to be the accuser. He was to accuse people of sin, and he overstepped his bounds, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So the red dragon is Satan. The child is the Messiah. In fact, the text says uh, the child is the one who would rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That's a reference to Psalm 2, which talks about uh, the Messiah, a messianic psalm. This woman escapes the red dragon, the baby escapes the red dragon, this woman goes into the wilderness for 1260 days. Now, here is where, this this section of scripture is where interpreting Revelation really starts to get hairy. I mean, it's been hairy since chapter 6, okay? People have tried to take these signs and these symbols literally and calculate dates and times. And I mean, you've probably read uh, some of these books over the years of people predicting the end of the world. And these are going to be the signs and these are going to be the times. I mean, this revelation gets used like this all the time. And this 1260 days is one of those things that gets used a lot. But that 1260 days, if you were to read your Old Testament, you would find that that is a symbolic number representing a time of trial and tribulation. That's all that it is. It's not meant to be taken literally. 1260 days or 42 months or three and a half years. It's not a literal number. It's just a a number that represents a time of trial and struggle. It is half of seven. We talked about seven being the number of of completion, the perfect number. Three and a half is half of seven. It's a time that's not yet complete or perfect. It's a time of trial and struggle. A time before you've gotten to the end. So, Let's continue reading at verse 7. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. 
But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they have loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And so God casts Satan out of heaven. He largely uh, disarms Satan. Christ's redeeming work had Satan cast down and disarmed. Colossians chapter 2 tells us that his, his weapons had been taken away from him. But Satan, in a desperate scramble, is trying to bring as many of God's creation with him into damnation as possible. And that's why the text says, Woe to you, O earth and sea, verse 12. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Satan is trying to desperately scramble and get as many people to turn away from God as he possibly can. So that is what is happening on a cosmic struggle. Okay? God knows that there needs to be a Messiah. The Messiah is born. The Messiah does what he needs to do, and he escapes death. He, he, he dies on the cross, but he's resurrected, and he, he ascends into heaven, and Satan is thwarted by his plans. He thought that he had killed the Messiah. He thought that he had thwarted God's plans, but God has succeeded, and Satan has been cast out. That's what's happening on a cosmic level. Now, what John does in, verses 13 through, uh, in chapter 13... What God does in chapter 13 uh, is that he zooms in a little bit. He zooms in a little bit. But first, we need to look at verse 13. When the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman who had given the two, was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time. Three and a half The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. And then the dragon became furious with the woman uh, woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. And so this is describing Satan's... uh, attempt to get God's people to turn away from God. He has everybody else. He has those people who are not God's people. Now he wants to get God's people to turn away. And he's still trying to do this to this day. Then we come to chapter 13, where John zooms in just a little bit. This is what's happening on a cosmic level. Now John zooms in and notices a worldly struggle a worldly struggle. Notice verse 1 of Revelation 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet like, uh, were like a bear's and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its Mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? So here is this this second character, the second evil character. So we, we talked about the dragon. Now we're talking about the sea beast. And in a minute, we're going to talk about the land beast. These make up uh, what many refer to as the unholy trinity. How many of you have ever heard that term before? We all ever heard it called the unholy trinity? Okay. These uh, make up what is, is referred to sometimes as the unholy trinity. I want us to remind ourselves This is written to people in the first century. This is written to people who lived in Ephesus 
and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis. Okay? This is written to people who lived 2,000 years ago. This means something to them before it means something to us. There has been so much time spent in Christian history of people trying to figure out who is that sea beast? Who is that land beast? And we're going to talk about 666 in a minute. What does that number stand for? Who is the 666? Whose name adds up to 666? I mean, so many books and things have been written and, 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 and largely it has been ignored that this is referring to someone who lived in the first century. This is talking about people who lived then. So, there is this sea beast who has been given power by the dragon. Now, uh, the, the, I think probably the interpretation here, it's talking about the ten horns, uh, is probably a reference to the sea beast is Caesar. Okay? The leader of the Roman government is Caesar. It is uh, most likely uh, the case. Uh, because during this time, uh, Caesar worship uh, became a, a, a law. Emperor worship started with Julius Caesar and was codified into law after that. The, the people in the Roman uh, world were supposed to uh, revere Caesar as Lord. Okay, this is referring to the Roman ruler, Caesar. During that time, it would have been Domitian. Hey, let's keep reading. The beast, verse 5, was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. And it opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blasphemy, blaspheming His name and His dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. And also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given uh, it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive... To captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Okay? So he has, John has zoomed in a little bit. The cosmic struggle, struggle is that God is fighting against Satan. He has zoomed in a little bit. And the way that this took place in people's actual lives was that the Roman government was forcing God's people to worship Caesar. And it would be like today if the, the American government said, hey, you need to worship the American government. You need to worship Joe Biden. Okay? You need to call him Lord. All right? I know y'all are sitting there laughing and chuckling, and the, uh, but, but that would be the equivalent of it today. You need to do that. And if you don't do that, we're going to take away your ability to, to buy things. We're going to take away your ability to live a good life if you don't do that. Okay? that. That's the equivalent of this. We might even kill you if you don't do that. So this is what is happening in a, on a worldly level, down in people's lives. So we've talked about the sea beast, which is most likely Caesar. Let's talk about the second beast. Let's talk about the land beast. Verse 11, and then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It looked like a lamb. It looked harmless like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. Okay? What would you do if you saw a cute little lamb and it roared like a lion? Probably wouldn't go around that lamb. I wouldn't think that it was cute. Okay? So there is this second beast it looks harmless, but it is definitely not harmless. It exercises all the authority of the first beast uh, in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. 
It also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and that number is 666. Now, the most likely, and I say this, look, John does not... It, it's not like the dragon. John tells us who the dragon is. It's Satan, okay? The, uh, the sea beast and the land beast, he does not tell us directly who that is. He allows that to be symbolic, okay? And so, so we can use our powers of deduction. We can use our, 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 our skills in, in, in looking back in history and looking at Scripture and looking at different signs and symbols throughout Scripture to try and get an idea, but we can't be definitive, Okay, so I'm not going to say you definitively uh, that this is the Roman government, but that's what I'm going to tell you uh, is my studied conviction. That the sea beast is Caesar and the land beast is the Roman government that carries out the rule and reign of, uh, of Rome, of Caesar, and, and forces people to worship Caesar and, and, and subsequently, consequently, to worship Satan. That is what the land beast is, is the Roman government uh, that, that looks harmless at first, right? Oh, the Roman government, that they gave us roads and they gave us peace and uh, the Roman, they, they, they love us, they take care of us, they do good things for us. It looks harmless, but it wasn't. It was actively against Christians of this age. Now, I don't think that there has been, ever been more controversy about a passage of Scripture. I was, talk, I was uh, talking to Ken, or I was hearing Ken talk this morning about this passage of Scripture uh, to Luis, and, and I think they're right. I mean, there's not been a more controversial passage of Scripture in the Bible over the years, probably in the last 200 years, than this passage. 666, who is the mark of the beast? Who, whose name does this spell? I mean, people have written volumes on who this person is and who they are in modern day. And, uh, you know, if you, if you add up Putin, the letter in Putin's name, he is the beast. And, I mean, how many times have you all heard that, right? Okay. Obama, you know, right? I remember back when Obama was president. Everybody was trying to make his name add up to 666. Okay, I mean, I, people have been doing this for for. A long, long time for, for years. Now, the text does say it's a man. Okay? Actually, if you write out Nero Caesar in Hebrew letters with their corresponding numbers, so it would be similar like uh, the, the letter A would be the number one, the letter D would be the number four. Okay? So if you do that in Hebrew... Um, then, and you write out Nero Caesar in Hebrew, it adds up to 666, okay? That's, that's, the, that, that's uh, the case. Uh, now, this is during the time of Domitian, okay? So Nero reigned before Domitian. Most likely what, that, what this is representing is Caesar, the mark of the beast refers to the Caesars, to the, the Roman rulers, and so what he's saying is, if you get the mark of the beast, the 666, it may not be a literal mark, a literal 666, but basically it's, it's an act of allegiance. If you pledge your allegiance to Caesar and to Rome and worship Caesar and Rome rather than worshiping God, that's going to be a problem. Now, I believe that this is a clear reference. The forehead and the hand is a clear reference to an Old Testament practice known as the Shema. How many of you have ever, ever heard of the Shema? Okay. It's an Old Testament practice uh, in which, uh, you, all of you should have raised your hands. I've talked about the Shema several times. Shame on y'all. You can't even, you can remember what you ate for lunch yesterday, but you can't remember that. Okay. So the Shema was a thing that, that, uh, that the Jews would say every morning when they would wake up. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Okay? And the text in Deuteronomy actually says, you bind this upon your forehead or upon your hand. You write it on the doorposts of your house. This is a reference to that. It was, a, uh, it was an act of allegiance. Every morning when I wake up, I'm going to say that you should love the Lord your God with all your, mind, your soul and your strength and your mind. Every morning they would wake up and say that. It was an act of allegiance. This is a reference to that. If you give your allegiance to the beast, if you give your allegiance to Rome, 
If you worship Rome, if you give in and say Caesar is Lord rather than saying Christ is Lord, that's going to be a problem. That's going to be a problem. That is not what God wants. Now, the unholy trinity, the dragon, the sea beast, the land beast, they serve as what's called an archetype. Okay? They serve as what's called an archetype for the way that Satan infiltrates all human institutions. This started at the very beginning of the Bible. You remember the story of the Tower of Babel, okay? where mankind tried to rise up and do things on their own and do things without God. That serves as an archetype all the way through the Bible. Babel, Babylon, Rome, and now every human nation. Every human nation is Babylon, is Rome. This is what happens. Satan infiltrates all human institutions. It started with Babel and has been this way ever since. When we start to put our hopes and our dreams into man-made institutions, the same thing happens today. The same thing happens today. We would be wise to take a page out of this book. We would be wise to take a page out of this book. The same things happen today. People put their hopes and their dreams in man-made institutions rather than in God. Okay, So we have the cosmic view. God zoomed out. On a cosmic level, God is fighting with Satan. And we have the zoomed-in view. This is what it looks like on the ground. Satan infiltrates uh, human institutions and he persecutes people and he tempts people to deny Christ. And this is happening. It's happened in every human civilization. It's happening in ours today. Let's look at some good news, chapter 14. Let's look at some good news. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name, uh, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice I heard was like the sound of, a, of harpists playing on harps. And they were singing a new song before the Lord. Uh, before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Now, I love this passage because people who try to take this book literally... They fall all over themselves in this passage because it talks about those who don't defile their garments are virgins. <laughs> okay, so if we take this literally, okay, if you, if you go into this book and you're like, every sign is literal and we're going to calculate everything and we're going to know the exact end, end of the age, if you do that, then you have a real struggle with passages like this in the book. Does it literally mean that those who were of the 144,000, that they're, it's just virgins, just people who have never had sexual activity, just virgins. Okay, it's not literal. Not literal, okay? What that is, is a reference. John is referring to the idea of a woman who is betrothed remaining loyal to her future husband by not running around on him. It's a symbolic way of saying that these Christians have remained true to Christ and wait faithfully for the return of the bridegroom. They've remained true to Jesus. They have not taken on themselves the mark of the beast. They have not given themselves over to idolatry and to Rome. So now, there are three angels who proclaim a message of good news. Some of it's not going to sound like good news, but I want us to to look at these three angels, starting with verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead, with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of the water. Fear God and give Him glory because judgment is coming. Is that not good news for people that will listen? Hey, listen up. Judgment is coming. You need to make sure that you fear God. You need to make sure that you're on His side. 
Listen up. That's good news to me. The second angel, verse 8, another angel, a second followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Babylon. Babylon the great. This isn't talking about the literal nation of Babylon, but figuratively, Babylon represents all human nations, and at this time, the human nation is Rome. Read Rome here, and subsequently, every human nation is falling because of their immorality. It is God's kingdom who will stand in the end. It is not these human kingdoms. Rome fell, Greece fell, Babylon fell. It is not the human kingdoms that will live until the end. It is God's kingdom that will last for eternity. This is good news. Not that we want human nations to fail, but that we know that we need to be in God's kingdom, that we need to be part of His kingdom, that we need to be on God's side. It's good news that we're hearing this. The third angel And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they will have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Boy, that's graphic. That's graphic. Those who give in to the unholy trinity and never turn to God will experience His wrath. And that doesn't sound like good news, but it's good news that we've heard it and that we know. We must not give in. And then upon hearing this news, John calls us to endurance. John calls us to endurance. Notice verse 12. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. That's the good news. We may die. We may struggle in this life. We may run into difficulty at every turn of this life. But the main thing is that we stay on the side of the Lord. We stay on the side of the Lord. Satan is working overtime to get you to go off the path, to go in different directions. And this section of Scripture, chapters 12 through 14, are written expressly for the purpose of encouraging you to endure. I don't know what Satan is doing in your life. Maybe he... Is hurting your family. Maybe you've got sick loved ones. Maybe he is stressing you out to the point where you can't think about anything but the thing that stresses you out. Maybe he's taken a loved one from you recently. Maybe, maybe there is a secret sin in your life that he is working on to grow. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but I want to tell you what John tells you. Endure. Endure. I want to leave you with the final verses of chapter 14 as a final reminder. There will come a day when we will be harvested. And there are two different harvests that are mentioned here in Revelation chapter 14. Notice verses 14 through 20. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud one like the son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, and the angel who was the authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put your sickle, 
Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. There's going to be a harvest. It's going to be a harvest of God's followers, that first angel with the sickle. And there's going to be a harvest of those who are God's enemies, that second angel with the sickle. I want us, I don't say this to get you all scared and, um, you know, this isn't a Christian haunted house or anything like that. I don't, I, don't want you, I don't want you to think that. I'm not saying this to get us all scared, but I want us to remember that who we stand with matters. Who we stand with matters. And right now, we may stand with Christ, but there is someone over here, an evil person. In truth, he is a a great red dragon, an evil dragon. And he is trying to pull us away. And he is using every method he can. Even methods that look harmless, like a lamb. I want us to remember that we've got to stand with Christ. Endure. Don't give up on your faith. Don't don't give in to the the spirit of the day. Don't give in to uh, the philosophies of the day. Don't give up on your faith. Don't give up on God's church. Don't give up on knowing Jesus and, and, and loving Him and having a relationship with Him. Don't give up on those things. And if you stumble and fall, get back up and 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 stay with Christ. Stick with Christ. Don't give up on Him. Endure. Now, certainly, we're not experiencing the persecution that they were experiencing. But there may come a day when that happens. Don't give up. Endure. Stick with Him. There will be a harvest. There will be a judgment. And I want us to be ready for it. I want every one of us to be ready for it. I want us to be among the Lamb's people, washed in the blood of the Lamb. I want us to be among those people able to stand in the judgment. I know that you want that too. I want to offer you an invitation. Maybe you've got something going on. Maybe you have a trial, a struggle. Maybe you're in a year, you're in the three and a half years. You're in the the 1260 days of, of, of trial and tribulation. Maybe your life is a trial right now. I mean, you are being bombarded from all different areas and angles. We want to pray for you. We want to spend time with you. Want to help you if we can, study with you. Whatever that is, that struggle, whether it's an external trial or an internal temptation, let's talk. Let's talk about sticking with the Lamb. Maybe you've never become a follower of the Lamb. Never, maybe you've never pledged your allegiance to Him. Maybe you, you don't have His name written on your forehead or your hand. We'd love to study with you and talk to you about that today. If you need something, We're going to sing this song. Come talk to me. Come up here while we sing the song or talk to an elder in the back or or talk to me privately sometime. Whatever it is that you need, don't hesitate. Come as we stand and as we sing.